Hello YouTube, this is uh, Dave coming to you once again with another watch review, this time for a modern vintage piece, my year 2000 Omega Seamaster Professional 300 meter chronometer certified dive watch, made famous by James Bond in the late 90s and early 2000s uh, with um, Pierce Brosnan. And uh, with one really striking difference, and that is this is the high polished a stainless steel bezel uh, rather than the blue aluminum bezel that uh, this watch traditionally comes with and I absolutely love this piece and what I want to do today is talk to you about the watch and then I'll follow that up really with um, how I came to to buy the watch and some things that um, I love about this bezel and the reason I'll review the watch first and then talk about that other stuff later is some of you may not be interested in kind of the process of uh, buying and selecting a watch uh, and all but but I think some of you are interested in the different aspects of what it's like to uh, make those difficult decisions in buying a watch and I'll talk about the decision-making process in getting this particular watch but for now this is a uh, again a chronometer certified Omega Seamaster professional this is dating to the year 2000 these were again were around the late 80s and or excuse me, late 90s and into the 2000s. So uh, they are starting to age. This one here being about 17 years old, um, though this is in really good condition. It was pretty scratched up when I got it, but I uh, did a little polishing uh, on the the bezel to kind of give it that high polished look, and, um, and and also did a little work on the on the clasp to try to get some of those scratches off. But uh, but otherwise, it's in really good condition. This particular watch is um, is 41 and a half uh, millimeters wide, uh, excluding the crown, with um, about 11 millimeter thick um, casing. And this is really a very thin watch. It wears very thin on my wrist, and I think the advantage of that, if I can show it to you here, is um, that because it lays thin, um, the, the, the watch head does not overshadow the bracelet. You know, so many large watches really do that. They kind of overshadow the edge of the bracelet. The bracelet sort of sits in the background. But in this case, from, from a direct on view, you get a really nice look at the bracelet. And with the stainless steel bezel, this um, particular bracelet seems to just fit right into the design, flows right into the design of the bezel, uh, really just kind of centering your attention on the, the blue wave dial. So let's talk about that dial for a minute. This dial is that classic wave dial that um, really was so popular when this watch first came out and um, just um, has that nice uh, uh, nice sheen to it uh, kind of this this blue is a, a kind of a, a metallic blue uh, it's kind of muted it's not the bright blue that I thought it would be uh, I have a previous review of the Alpha Seamaster that I bought to kind of try out this style of watch. And that really didn't do a good job because that blue was so electric that I really couldn't get a feel for the blue. But the blue on this is just perfect. And you can see the waves there in the dial. And uh, some people think that might be a little over the top, but I think it's uh, it's really a beautiful deal. And then, of course, we have the hands, which are um, skeletonized hands. Uh, with uh, different tips on the end, one round and one triangular. And what I really do appreciate about this watch is um, the skeleton can be, in, you know, on the Alpha Seamaster was just terrible as far as readability because the, uh, the, the, the pieces, the outer edges of the skeleton uh, did not have loom on them. And this has loom uh, outlining the entire hand which means no matter which way you hold this uh, watch and no matter how much the stainless steel kind of gets caught in, um, in you know, in a dark spot, you're still, like, uh, you're still going to see it. If this were that Alpha Seamaster, you would not see the hands right now. They'd be almost lost. But this, in this case, uh, you can see the reflection. Uh, you can see my reflection in that, but you see it uh, reflecting off the hands. And so in some part, some lights, the, the hands really light up, and where they don't, you get the loom to kind of give to direct your attention to the time. Another feature of this watch over the the latest ceramic version, ceramic bezel versions, is uh, that which those particular watches have the um, 
have the applied uh, hour markers. This has uh, painted on uh, hour markers, uh, painted on with loom as we get a close up shot here. And you can see it's just starting to yellow a little bit, the, lumin the luminescence, as this um, watch just starts its patina in process. Uh, they say that these watches, once they get to about 20 years old, they really start to do that a little bit. This one being 17 years old and well made, well cared for, um, not not quite showing up quite so much, but uh, you can see it will have a nice yellowing patina look as as the watch goes on. And these aren't scratches here; they're just this is just a very difficult watch uh, to keep clean um, because of the high polished uh, look of the bezel. So we'll try to get that is. Um, sparkling clean as we can. So that's a really a mirror finish and I, I think it gives this watch a very classy look. Now if we talk about the um, the movement behind this is the uh, Omega uh, 1120 and it's a beautiful, um, beautifully decorated movement and um, I just think it's um, very classy uh, that they, that despite the fact that this is covered up with a solid case pack, you're going to get a very attractive uh, movement underneath and uh, it is a variation of I believe the 2892 ETA-A2 and um, but what's different is they added a couple of jewels to it and this has been uh, regulated to chronometer uh, specifications so this is uh, very accurate I have uh, just in a few days gotten it to about four and a half to five seconds a day is about what I'm getting uh, fast so uh, again, well within the chronometer certification. And that's what's beautiful about these particular uh, Omega movements is that they just build them to such that, you know, when they're running the way they're supposed to run, you get, uh, you get a very accurate watch. And of course you have the beautiful textured uh, case back with the Seamaster logo, as well as the little Omega logo at the bottom. It's a beautiful touch. And uh, of course you, um, have the screw down crown with the Omega label, the Omega, there we go, and Omega's over here as well, if we can get that to focus, and that's on the helium release valve, uh, and so that turns and releases helium, and of course I have absolutely no functional use for that, but it is a relief to know that if I ever do fall to the bottom of the ocean, you know, some thousand feet down and someone pulls me out, all they got to do is untwist that and that'll let out all the helium and it will save my watch even if uh, they don't save me. So the watch will survive. That's good to know. Now we move on to the to the uh, bracelet. Sorry. And uh, again, I'm going to compare this a little bit to the Alpha Seamaster. The Alpha Seamaster had a big gap between this first um, end link and the rest of the bracelet. And, and it was very sharp like this. So no matter which way you had it, you always had this sharp protruding edge. This does not happen. This uh, falls very beautifully down. This is a, a 20 millimeter lug width, so not the 21 oddball size that my um, Speedmaster has. Uh, and it is just beautifully designed, beautifully decorated. It has the uh, polished uh, outer sections of those middle links. And it just looks um, really, a, you know, it's got a little bling to it. When I was wearing this at work today and admiring it, and you see it on the wrist, you see that it's just got um, a lot of bling to the whole look of the watch. And that's really part of the bracelet style. And in this bracelet, you have a, a clasp that's a double push button clasp. And it really has a very satisfying snap. You have um, half links here. I took one half link out to size this down a little bit uh, compared to what it was when I bought it. So I have one half link out of this, um, though I'm sure the original watch came with more links. Uh, this also has a diver's extension that snaps in there. This comes loose pretty easily. That's uh, a little frustrating because when I put on the watch, I have to really push that one in, and then I have to push push that one in. And then we have um, a, little, a few scratches, show a little wear on there, but um, in, in real life and everyday life, it, it looks just fine. But I'm very pleased uh, with the, uh, the bracelet. Uh, one of the shortcomings, of course, is the pin and collar 
uh, connections there. So when I pulled the uh, half link out, you know, you would lose the, the little collars in there. So you had to be very careful not to lose those, or you've got a watch that, that won't hold together. So overall, I, I love the design and the look of this watch. Uh, Jay Anthony has a great video out there of the blue, bezel, blue bezeled version of this. So I really, if you're if you're interested in that watch uh, or this watch, you know, be sure and watch his. He 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 uh, did a very thorough review, and I think I uh, got a lot of information from him. And I just think um, you'll be thrilled uh, with with his review. I, I will wind it up for you. And here's what's amazing about winding this watch. Nearly silent. You can hear a little click in there, and I'm guessing that that clicking is because the mainspring is fully wound up just for me wearing it all day so that's a protection and then this is a screw down crown and then of course you have the 28,800 beats per hour sweeping hand and I will tell you um, you know my uh, Christopher Ward also has the same beat rate but I tell you this seems to be the smoothest beat rate I've ever seen just really smooth quite uh, it really is quite smooth and, and since I mentioned the, the Christopher Ward, just to give, help you get some size real, uh, comparisons here, this is a 43 millimeter uh, versus the 41 and a half. Uh, and it, this definitely feels like it has a lot more heft, even though it's just a millimeter and a half difference. Um, this feels like a smaller, much smaller watch than this one. We'll try to line the, the bezels up, and you can see the height difference on the bezels. And the watch itself has definitely a greater extension in length. So 43 millimeters with, you know, about a, uh, it's probably a 15 millimeter uh, thickness, you're going to see a significant difference. So on the wrist, um, the Christopher Ward is a little bit of a beast. But on the wrist, this thing is very subtle. Um, and for what it loses in size, it makes up for in bling from just all the, the light that's hitting this thing everywhere. Okay, so that's sort of my review of the watch, but I want to tell you the story if you're interested, and you can just tune out if you're not, but they're interested uh, in how I came about buying this watch. Because if you're a watch collector, and chances are if you're watched this far, I'm pretty sure you are. You're fascinated by this, and you go through the same difficult decision-making process that I do, you know, because there's this thing called opportunity cost. When you have a certain amount of money and you spend it on this, you're not just buying a watch, but you're choosing not to buy other watches. And you're limiting your ability to buy those watches. So because I've purchased this, I now have watches I cannot buy. So when you're making a, a watch purchase decision, you're, you're the, the, probably it's not hard to pick a watch to buy. It's just hard to pick watches not to buy. And so uh, a little background, I sold my Bomb and Mercier. Um, and the reason I sold it, is uh, even though it tech, uh, checked all the boxes that I liked for um, wearing it, uh, a nice dressy chronograph at work, it was the right color brown and all of that. And I have, the, of course, a review here that you can go look at. But the Capelin, as beautiful a watch as it was, it took up a lot of my watch dollars. I, you know, I, I spent quite a bit on that. And, and, I, and it was just limiting me from buying anything else, having my watch money into that watch. So I put it up for sale for a while and just waited until I got a really good offer. I finally got a, a really good offer, sold that watch, and uh, sent it on. Then um, my my uh, beautiful, wonderful, uh, new, to me anyway, Jazz Master Chronograph Hamilton watch, um, I reviewed that on this uh, channel. You can find that a few videos back. And a week after I reviewed it, the the movement just, it was catastrophic failure. It just stopped. There was nothing I could do to get it started again. Uh, so it was within the return period, so I returned it. Suddenly having a, a significant amount of money, I went from having very little money in my PayPal account to having around $1,600 of watch money burning a hole through my PayPal account. So... I'm a firm believer if you've got the money and it's set aside for watches, buy a watch. Enjoy your watch. Uh, even if you're saving up, buy a watch that you can sell and resell and get your money back on. And so I began to wonder about what, what would I get. 
you know, the, the one logic could be is go ahead and continue to save up for a Grail watch. Like uh, my Grail watch currently is the Aqua Terra in blue, the Skyfall, uh, beautiful Bond watch. And um, it's either that or my, uh, or, or a Breitling uh, Super Ocean Heritage 2 and 42 millimeters. I tried that on at a dealer and absolutely loved that uh, particular watch. So one of those two uh, I could see in the future. But right now, uh, I cannot add much money at all to my watch collection because my wife and I are both in graduate school again, getting more degrees, and my kids are getting ready to go to college. And that's important stuff to the family, and I would feel really guilty if we were really living tight, and it's because it was all on my wrist or in my watch box. Yeah, I wouldn't feel bad for long, I, I admit, but I would feel bad. So I, I, I don't have a lot of room to add thousands of dollars to my watch collection to be able to get either of those Grail watches. So for now, um, you know, I had the 1600 and I could probably add up to maybe 2000 and that was sort of my budget. What could I get for $2,000? And what I really began to look at was the Longines Master Collection Triple Date Moon Phase. Uh, I saw some reviews of that and just became very impressed with that watch. And the reason I was impressed with it is because of the way that they were able to cram so much watch in... Uh, such a reasonable price of um, you can get them on the aftermarket for around two thousand dollars I also was pleased with the fact that while most of them are um, 40 millimeters they do make a 42 millimeter and I was finding a few of those available for sale and that's really where I was saving I was heading for that watch um, but then I realized that one of the things that caused me to lose my satisfaction with the Bomb and Mercier is because it checked a bunch of boxes that um, it made me really admire the watch. It made me love the watch with my head, but I just didn't love it with my heart, if that makes any sense at all. It just wasn't one that I really had a strong emotional tie to. And then I began to wonder the same about the long jeans. I loved the watch intellectually. I love for its design and how much they were able to put into that one case and just really believed that, you know, that would be a great watch to have, but would it be a watch that I loved? And I, and you know, this is how it is in the watch collecting. When you finally have the money and you finally find the watch and you can finally pull the trigger and you find yourself not doing it, then you're telling yourself something. And I began to realize that maybe that wasn't the, uh, the watch for me. So I went back to the drawing board and, um, you know, uh, I, I will just tell you that uh, my love for Omega is very strong, but I just didn't think there was any way, any watch out there that existed for under $2,000 that wasn't a 34 or 36 millimeter vintage dress watch. And I really wasn't interested in that. So, um, but I was perusing a seller called Closer 0924, C-L-O-S-E-R 0924, uh, out of Japan, who has a ton of Omega vintage watches, and couldn't believe when I was seeing the blue bezel, blue bezeled version, for between sixteen hundred and two thousand um, dollars. In mint mint uh, condition, ones were going for around twenty two to twenty four hundred, and um, I had completely forgotten about that watch after selling the Alpha Seamaster. I kind of lost interest in that watch because of my bad experience with the Alpha. But then I thought, you know, I should reconsider that. I shouldn't judge an Omega by an Alpha. So I began to look and realized that I, I wasn't a fan of the blue, of having so much blue in the watch, at least not until I get my Aquaterra. In this watch, it was just, there just was too much blue with the blue bezel. And then when I stumbled across this one with the stainless steel, I was in love. I knew that was the one. So let me tell you why I love this. Number one, uh, I think this is going to be a little more durable than the um, the blue bezel version. The blue bezel version, that aluminum, uh, just scratches so easily. And just about every watch that was for sale had some significant markings and scratches. And even though you know these are really showing up on the video, they just don't show up in real life. This watch looks brand new out in the wild when you see it on my wrist. And so I, I, I really like that. I also have been attracted to the stainless steel, the idea of a stainless steel bezel. I had uh, interviewed a young man 
just a couple of days ago who had a aqua racer a tag hoyer with the uh, stainless steel bezel and after seeing that i i just remind was reminded how much i admire that design so this checks off that box for me as well and then another thing that i absolutely love is that this particular bezel has engraved markings you don't get that on the blue aluminum bezel that's all painted on and this has uh, all engraved pieces into in the um, in the bezel itself and what's kind of rare is I happen to find a copy where all the blue that's embedded in the engraved markings is still there uh, many watches these that was worn off in several places but this it's all there and so I'm gonna treat it very gently over the course of the next many years uh, as long as I keep this watch and um, to to just um, protect that and to, to keep the blue um, I just will throw in a shameless plug that I'm from Dallas Texas and I'm a huge Dallas Cowboys fan so it doesn't make me too unhappy to know that this is a great Sunday Dallas Cowboy viewing watch because it has a, <laughs> the blue and silver going around it so um, man that you know that's sort of colors that are touching my heart uh, so I love the engraved markings I had that on my uh, uh, Marathon GSAR and just thought it was classy addition and with the texture of the dial as you so plainly can see here why not a little texture on the bezel and this provides that so even though this is not the modern day uh, ceramic which is absolutely a beautiful piece this is I think the second best you know I, I'm one of those that once you go ceramic it's really hard to go back to aluminum and the, the stainless steel really kind of is a happy medium uh, I mentioned earlier I love the way the design just flows into the stainless steel all the way through and it really just allows this beautiful dial to kind of stand out and be the center of attention and so finally the very last reason and I if you stay tuned all the way to the end here then you're about to hear uh, the thing that I love most about the steel bezel while the blue bezel version ran about sixteen hundred to eighteen hundred dollars pretty beat up I picked up this watch for thirteen hundred and fifty dollars that's an amazing price for a modern day modern sized Omega dive watch for thirteen hundred and fifty dollars with uh, a, a classic uh, movement that is very well respected the pre um, coaxial that was just so mastered and so beautifully done and, and to get that for thirteen hundred fifty dollars I couldn't couldn't believe when this watch showed up at my house and just looked so beautiful and was so amazing on the wrist and to have a second Omega I've got my Speedmaster that I paid a whole lot more money for than this and to know that um, I've got a watch that I can turn around and sell in a few years when I'm ready to finally add some money and get that Aquaterra and I need to sell this one I'll be able to do that and then the last well, I'll throw one more last thing in there this this year this was made in the year 2000 it just so happens that my son was born in the year 2000 he's developed a love for watches and who knows if in the next year he really expresses some love for this maybe this will be his graduation gift and he can have a birth year watch that he can carry with him the rest of his life and be proud of because I would certainly be proud of it if he did well this is the Omega Seamaster Professional in stain, high polished stainless steel and I'm glad you tuned in I appreciate a like if you can give it to me and uh, I'll see you in the next video take care